Previously on the British Broadcasting Century. After Marconi Station 2MT Rittle begins broadcasting from a muddy field in Essex, another Marconi Station 2LO begins broadcasting from a fancy building in that there London. And just six days later, another pop-up radio station pops up. But this one isn't Marconi's. In this exciting episode, and it is exciting, I've had a sneak peek, and then there were three. Yes, 2ZY Manchester joins the party, bringing music and children's broadcasting. And so, oh, we'll be chatting to children's broadcasting star Sir Chris Jarvis from CBBS and Children's BBC and almost everything Britain's children have seen since the mid-90s. So, are you sitting comfortably? Then why don't you listen with Mother, go through the round window, because here is a box, a musical box, wound up and ready to play. This is the British Broadcasting Century. From me, to you, to me, to you. Hello, hello, this is Paul Carenda calling. This is London Calling. Hello, hello, Paul Carenza calling. Thank you for joining us. Many more have, which is lovely. Uh, we're getting a really nice community building up on Facebook and on Twitter, both at BB Century. We've had TV and radio producers, retired and current, sharing old photos of equipment, old pages of old broadcasting books, old memories of the BBC canteen, and basically getting stuck in. So you're most welcome there. Dare I say, it's starting to feel like some kind of audio museum because, you know, rare clips are actually being unearthed. And and part of the reason for this podcast uh, to begin with was to preserve some of these lovely old clips and memories and things and then release them publicly back into the wild. And I hesitate before saying that this podcast is starting to feel... No, not important. Significant? No, not can't be significant. Definitely not. Fun? Yes, definitely. Well, I enjoy it anyway. But also, yes, this is somewhere that those old audio clips can hopefully hole up and weather the digital storm, as long as we're allowed to keep these clips here. If you have any gloriously old audio clips, I'm talking radio from the 1920s, 30s, do send them our way. My understanding is that about 75 years plus makes it largely public domain. And of course, there's that old misunderstood fair use rule that, you know, if we talk about a thing and comment on it, then we can play a chunk of it. I don't know if I'd buy that. But also, there's no commercial gain here. This podcast costs uh, money. So we're not here to benefit. We just want to store some of these things for future listeners. So do send us any old classic clips if you happen to have any stored away. But really, we're talking about pre-1940s for quite some time yet. Now, speaking of the old Kasharuni, if you fancy changing that situation about this costing money and helping support us, I would love to keep these podcasts up forever, and I certainly hope to. Currently, that's costing about 100 quid a year for online hosting. Uh, The microphone costs another 100. Don't tell the missus. But I've certainly spent about 100 quid on books in making this podcast. In fact, thank you to one lovely listener who actually threw me a few quid to help me afford a rather expensive but incredibly useful book. You know who you are, and I love the show that you produce for BBC One. I will say no more than that. And the book we got with it, ah, it's fantastic. It just gives us a few hints of what was played and when, and that helps us find those songs and recreate them for your ears. So if you fancy chipping in at all, you're more than welcome. You can find us at patreon.com slash paulcarenza. That comes with monthly benefits and things like that. And some of you have joined the Patreon thing. A huge thanks and welcome to Andrew B. I will leave him as anonymous as that for now until he says otherwise. Thanks to good folk like you. That's either another few months of online hosting taken care of, or we could get another book with it. There's a great one on the BBC's years at Savoy Hill that I've certainly got my eye on, but that's for next series. Now, another listener, in fact, has contributed rather differently. Uh, Emily has introduced me to this episode's brilliant guest. And by the way, if you can do likewise and bag us a broadcasting legend for the podcast, please do get in touch. Or maybe you are a broadcasting legend. We'd love to have you on. So welcome Chris Jarvis to the show this week. If you don't know Chris, ask a child or anyone who has been a child in the last couple of decades. He's been entertaining and informing and educating our youngest generation for, well, for a generation at least, uh, via Show Me, Show Me, stargazing old jack's boat all on cbb's the broom cupboard and the anorak back in children's bbc days so much to delve into on this podcast so it seemed like the right episode because this week in our story of the bbc's birth we reach 2zy manchester and with them and with another station in 1922 5it birmingham we get children's broadcasting so it seemed like the perfect moment to chat to a legend 
like Chris Jarvis? I, I, I'm not sure I'd go that far, but um, I am lucky to have survived um, 27 years on children's television. And um, what is lovely now, I am meeting parents who watched me as well as their children. And, um, you know, so, so there's a lovely, it's lovely to be part of people's lives. Yeah, it's its own cuddly little world, children's TV. But first then, 2ZY Manchester. How so? Well, last week we looked at 2LO London, the second radio station that launched, and that was in May 1922. Now, a month earlier, Marconi boss Godfrey Isaacs did an interview with the Wireless World magazine. I'm sure you still subscribe today. He foresaw a radio industry with important announcements to reach all parts of the country, along with talks, music, weather, news, etc. I don't think anybody realises how big a thing this is going to be. Godfrey Isaacs reckoned there would be two or three stations in the country in different regions. And a month later, it was so. But just after the Marconi man said that, the postmaster general, the government's representative in charge of wireless radio, he had a thing or two to say as well in Parliament. It would be impossible to have a large number of firms broadcasting. It would result only in a sort of chaos. It's compelled the United States to do what we're now doing at the beginning, that is, to lay down very drastic regulations indeed for the control of wireless broadcasting. The chaos of the ether was the government's fear. You could summarise it in a simple motto. Don't be like America. Plus a change. Here's broadcasting historian Tim Wonder. By the end of the summer of 1922... 50 companies have applied to do radio stations because they look to America where America has gone down the commercial route. Rittle and Eckersley didn't advertise. They, they put a few adverts out for the Chapel Music Company because that was their high five, but he got bored with that very quickly. In America, commercial radio has developed so that if you're selling tires or bread or religion or some very unsavory things in case there's, you just put a transmitter in your town. And if your transmitter can't be heard, you just increase the power. So American stations are at 50,000 watts. The Postmaster General decided to allow bona fide manufacturers of wireless apparatus to apply under post office supervision, but no more than eight stations, mind you. That was the random figure plucked out of the ether. Any more? And it could get positively American, where at this point there were now over 200 stations, and most of them seemed to spend their time advertising washing powder. So between the visionary dreaming of Godfrey Isaacs at Marconi's and the limits set by the government, we somehow get a third radio station. Some of the commercial stations, they were worried about the fact it was Marconi dominated. You had companies like 2ZY, Metropolitan Vickers up in uh, Manchester, Trafford Park, who really went, actually, we'd like a piece of this airwaves. After Marconi's 2MT in Rittle in Essex, and after Marconi's 2LO in London, comes Metropolitan Vickers 2ZY in Manchester. There's another company helping out, the Radio Communication Company. So you've got a couple of companies working together. Now there's an idea. Here's 2ZY's first station director speaking many years ago, Kenneth Wright. In those days we didn't know there was going to be a unified BBC and we in the north felt ourselves in competition with Marconi in the south and uh, we were hoping of course we could put a kink in our wave or something to give us an advantage But uh, in fact, we developed at the same time as Captain Peter Eckersley was developing in Rittle. And all of this is just five days after 2LO launches in London. 2ZY Manchester broadcast more in the sober 2LO London vein than the less sober 2MT Rittle vein. But yes, if 2LO and 2MT are, are friendly rivals to each other, both under the Marconi umbrella, as we heard with last week's pranks, then this new 2ZY is a much fiercer rival to them both. Being non-Marconis without the patents, they have much more to prove. So in time, 2ZY Manchester would innovate and they would bring us the first wireless live orchestra and by November, the first children's programmes. So an orchestra and children's, it's a lot like Salford today, just down the road from where they first broadcast. Here's a man who knows BBC children's broadcasting like the back of his hand, Chris Jarvis. I think that where children's TV is very attractive for people like me is that it's 
probably the last place where you find true variety. I mean, in my job on CBeebies, I get to act and I get to do comedy and sing and be a presenter, all those different things. Whereas I don't think you get to do that anywhere else in television. Yeah. So, I mean, for a jack of all trades and master of none like me, you know, it's a great place to be. But it is it comes with its own sort of, oh, it sounds a bit grand to call it science. But, you know, there is a there is a lot to children's television which people probably don't realise. And I certainly didn't realise. Um, especially with preschool TV, I'm learning all the time. The people who, you know, quite often started years ago on programs like Play School, which we all remember, have put together this whole sort of way of doing things. And it's based on curriculum. It's based on entertainment. It's based on so many things. And, and, I, and I'm quite proud to be part of it because when you go around the world, you'll find Play School in Australia and all these other places that still have BBC programs and children's TV programs that originated here. And a lot of the ways of doing things come from here. I mean, the only thing that really rivals it is Sesame Street and the Muppets in America. But otherwise, we, we kind of lead the field and there are CBBS channel a lot of people don't know this but there are individual CBBS channels separate to the one we have in this country in many different territories you know where, which the BBC worldwide run carrying our programs and they're all loved as well so show me show me the main program I do at the moment which is like a modern day play school it doesn't just go out in Britain it goes out everywhere but all of Britain's children's broadcasting starts at 2ZY Manchester here once again is that first station boss Kenneth Wright And what appealed to me very much was, here is a chance of putting wonderful music and all the other things into people's homes. And I was particularly interested in children and giving them good music instead of bad music and so on. So we were, I I think we were the first people to start children's programs uh, from the very beginning, the 15th of November. In 1923, we started giving weekly talks uh, in uh, French, teaching French and then Spanish and German and eventually Italian as well. These things went on week after week. We also had reviews of books. We had weekly talks about gardening and the kind of things that uh, other people adopted, if I may say so, after us. One of the things that uh, we created from the very beginning was a thing called Mr. X's Corner, which followed the news every evening. and. It was a thing which developed ultimately into what we now call current events. Now, at this point in our grand story of the BBC's birth, we are in May at 2ZY's launch. And it's another six months before it brings children's shows to the airwaves. But it is the first to do so. On November the 15th, the day of a general election. So, in fact, the first children's broadcast that we know about is in this mega show of election results, with, weirdly, a brief kiddies corner mingled in. So much as election results today, the entire show stays on air until 1am. We don't quite know if the kiddies corner made it as late as 1am, It's nearly time for the very young kids to be getting up again. But yeah, mixed with the latest winners and losers of constituencies up and down the country, we would have heard songs that night given by the Lady of the Magic Carpet, played by Miss A.L. Benny. Kenneth Wright, the station director, was Uncle Humpty Dumpty. Uh, Another of our friends was the Sandman, who used to sing the children to sleep. Well, I was a schoolboy at the time, and I think I was about 10 or 11 years old. And I rejoiced in the name of Dinko, the foreman of the Pixies. And that's Reginald Jordan there, one of the other early announcers at 2ZY Manchester. Yes, he was an announcer at... About 10 or 11 years old. I don't know what you were doing at 10 years old, but I bet you weren't announcing radio in 1920s Manchester. The station staff, from announcers to station boss, would adopt the titles of uncles. Within a few months, aunties as well. The first to try the uncle's model was yet another radio station, 5IT Birmingham. Three weeks after 2ZY Manchester brought children's programming to the air with those mixed election results, 5IT Birmingham begin their children's programming, featuring the tale of two dwarves called Spick and Span and a gramophone record for children, The Dance of the Goblins. In charge of this at 5IT Birmingham, it's one A.E. Thompson, who actually appeared as the very first wireless uncle, Uncle Tom. This uncle idea really took off in Britain and America. At 2LO London, Arthur Burroughs became Uncle Arthur on the acclaimed Children's Hour. He took the title Children's Hour from this poem by Longfellow. You will remember from last week that Arthur Burroughs loved his Longfellow poems. (coughs) 
The night shall be filled with music. No, no, not that one. This one. Between the dark and the daylight, when the night is beginning to lower, comes a pause in the day's occupations that is known as the children's hour. It's a great honour to be part of something that people truly love. And it's a bit like BBC local radio and, well, a lot of radio stations, actually, including some of the national ones. I think people would use that word, love. They love it. You know, they depend, they're dependent on it. They need it. So especially BBC local radios and speech stations like LBC, Talk Radio, which are a friend in their ear. And I think that CBeebies falls into that category as well. People love it because it really helps them out. We're part of people's lives. And I think more so, really. Really, because it's a very special, precious time for young parents with, with kids for the first time. You know, they discover this thing called CBeebies that helps them through the day. We have a bedtime story when they go to bed to help them. And, and, and we properly end the, our broadcasting. We're one of the few channels that stops to actually give some sort of finality to the day so that children know when to go to bed. But also in the morning, you know, we wake them up with, you know, a lively show, but, you know, not, not too two bananas that we we drive the parents potty but you know also handy things like at the moment with we're in the pandemic dr Rand has been doing some brilliant stuff about how to stay safe without frightening children i mean it's it's really good stuff it's easy to love something that that does that whereas it's probably difficult to love bbc one (laughs) because it is so many things it's so many things and it's not always good things you you know a lot of people find i don't know eastenders is is a brilliantly made drama but sometimes it can be a bit menacing i find it a bit depressing myself you, you know it's, it's hard to love maybe a show like that but it's very easy to love um a, a channel like cbb's or a, a local radio station that really helps you in your life without sounding too um fanciful but you know it's all it's all about love really you know a lot of the programs made for cbb's are made with love you know, especially things like moon i mean it means nothing to people who don't have children or haven't seen cbb's but there are some very sweet programs like moon and me which are made with love in mind it's all about reassurance and you know hopefully kids are watching it and actually thinking ah oh, you know that's a good way to be you know looking after each other and and all those important things all those life skills that might otherwise be uh, sort of missed out in the hurly burly of everyday life when children's hour got going it was much loved it ran five days a week from five till six p.m from 1922 to 1964 it's one of the longest running shows the bbc has ever had It said that at the end, though, Children's Hour wasn't listened to much by children, more by elderly women reminding them of their youth. Still, its cancellation led to questions in Parliament. Now, all of this, by the way, is in the brilliant book Life on Air, A History of Radio 4 by David Hendy. And, whisper it, David Hendy, he follows us on Twitter, so maybe he's listening to this. Hello, David. Love your book. So why cancel the beloved Children's Hour? Well, the axe was swung by Frank Gillard, who also created BBC Local Radio, and he divvied up BBC Radio into radios 1, 2, 3 and 4. And that's all related to the cancellation of Children's Hour. Because ultimately time was up, because the young'uns it was aimed at were now turning to television, pop music and pirate radio. And over the years, the competition has only grown. Here's Chris Jarvis again. Whereas before we used to compete with ITV and then Nickelodeon, all these other channels, we're not really anymore because the, the real competition is, is just about everything. <laughs> what children watch, you know, <laughs> on YouTube and play games. This week, my children have been watching uh, CBeebies, but also Hamilton because I'm a oh terrible my. parent. So um, I just, I know exactly the right points to cough. Yeah. And then it's, then it's going to be fine, you know. So when we make a programme, they're shot like movies. And with Show Me, Show Me Now, we have a, a, a shoot like, like a film with cameras on great big cranes and huge lighting. And, and we make fewer programmes, hopefully better, you know, in terms of the production, definitely, because that's who we're competing with. So it does need to stand up against, certainly the look of it needs to look as good as a Pixar movie. If you look at what CBeebies is doing at the moment, so for example, we've, we've recently put together a prom that introduces children to, to classical music. There have been ballets put together. We've, we've tackled Shakespeare. We did the, the Tempest and the Midsummer Night's Dream. Now you see 
I mean, I would never have thought that was possible. And if, if I was the commissioner, I mean, I, I'm so blinkered and, 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 and not really smart enough to have thought that could ever work. And I, and I wasn't even sure even when I had the script in my hand and, and there I was being King Alonso, you know, just thinking, are they really going to get this? <laughs> <laughs> but they did. And, and they love it and they watch it over and over again. And that's another thing about children's um, viewing behaviours now. When they watch something, they tend to watch it again. Um, kids, you know, as, as you know, love repetition, but um, they're in an era where they can. It's very easy to watch things again at a press of a, of a button. And so all that sort of information drips, even if they don't get it the first time, by the third or fourth viewing, I think they really do get what it's all about. Surely that's an amazing, and that really is a, a teaching um, and learning experience but I think that for as long as they're they're dangerous and 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 trying all these things I think it will always excel and and get better and better I mean what next opera I don't know but you know it's but they're all also done Dickens at at Christmas time and 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 if these things had been made and then not watched I would be of the opinion that you know they should just stick to play school and, and we shouldn't be bothering with all this stuff. But the fact that the viewing figures are so massive and these programmes are so well received, I think norm- normally it shouldn't just be about viewing figures, but but it but it is as well because it's a measure of the fact that something so bold and ambitious as ballet on CBBS is working and they are, and they like it well I, I think john reese would be proud i think he would think it's in safe hands I, th- I think of all the all the channels he probably would be and I, I, i'm not sure over the years i mean i've been you know party to things that i'm not really that proud of i think looking back you know just just things that maybe language that wasn't quite right i don't know but you know you, i just think right now the the care and and the love that goes into putting a program together everything is so well thought out i think it's all really quite quite beautiful actually you know everything that goes out for children these days now back at 2zy manchester in 1922 it was a slow and steady test signal sort of start that summer it could be heard not just in manchester but northern ireland the channel islands even paris 2zy found their feet with a nice schedule as well you've got children's hour from five till six then the news at six a talk at seven entertainment from eight until ten so let's leave children's for a moment and have a look at some of those other wonders of 2zy manchester they innovated drama giving us one of the first in-house repertory theater companies in the country and also what's manchester if not a provider of music under station boss dan godfrey they began the first in-house orchestra on the radio 12 players this 2zy orchestra eventually had a chorus and an opera company as well and it would form the basis of the bbc philharmonic that we still know and love today now for a while their technical kit couldn't really keep up with the music so there were dodgy microphones to begin with they actually found that one certain note completely distorted so for a while they tried to avoid all songs with that danger note in it Apparently, Hawaiian melodies were found to be perfect at avoiding, uh, well, whatever the note was. It was clearly such a dangerous note, they didn't even write it down in the history books. Ultimately, 2ZY would go on to be more the place for music than 2LO in the capital, say. British composers often gave their first outings to 2ZY. Elga's Enigma Variations, Holst's Planet Suite, all were granted to what would become the BBC Philharmonic. So while 2ZY Manchester were doing what they were doing back in 1922, let's zoom in on what 2MT Rittle was doing, that wild child of a radio station. Well, with 2ZY hosting classical and children's, and 2LO were hosting light opera and talks, this flippant one-man comedy station 2MT Rittle, they've got to keep up. Oh, Peter Eckersley did have an innovative children's slot. He had a five-minute feature of nursery rhymes for children, but he couldn't help aiming them at his geeky, techie audience. may have gone over the children's head. It certainly goes over mine today. We made up some um, technical children's. Uh, I remember one was um, Hey Little Dud Road, four grids and a, three grids and a quadro. The outer one forming the plate, the electrons got muddled with so many grids, but the final M value was eight. Nursery rhymes with an and, engineering um, twist. Four and twenty B valves standing on the shelf. Ash couldn't find one. I had to go myself. <laughs> when the circuit opened, the valve began to sing. Don't you think that I was right to smash the beastly thing? I realise that there are problems with where people are going at the moment to hear their nursery rhymes. Because a new parent doesn't know any different, might say to their um, Alexa or whatever, um, play a nursery rhyme that it's not guaranteed that they're going to get 
a British version of it or indeed a very good version of it because all these platforms like Spotify, Deezer and everything is there. You're not necessary unless you're, unless you hit lucky and you get the right playlist and that, that suits you, you're not necessarily going to get the best music. It's all very democratic, but it's not necessarily the best. Now you've got little radio. That's your, that's your baby, isn't it? Is that right? And, and magic den has come from that. Well, I'm working on the CBBS magic den, which is a radio show for CBBS radio and, and uh, BBC Sounds. I'm in a magic den with Stuffy, who's a, a cube that exists on Show Me, Show Me. And we set up Little Radio initially as, you know, it's almost a bit of a vanity project, you know, that I've, I've been trying to get off the ground for a very long time. But really, I, I, I feel there is a place for it. There's probably room for another few children's radio stations. I think it's great. There are 36 children's television stations there's room for a lot more but we all compete really well and and it's it's sad that that you know that, that that's what should happen in in radio too because in um in television we we all talk regularly we, we have a children's media conference where all the all the networks get together i've just ho- hosted a webinar with kadoodle and um and sky kids but they all know each other and and they work together to get because because it's a common goal. And if anything, it's it's probably better than than it has ever been because but because it has its own space, it has its own time. And I think that's it. it's all about time because when you've got thirteen hours a day to entertain, educate, and inform children, you can go into much better detail. You can really think about what you're doing, and you've also got i mean there's so many reasons why i think we're in a better place and 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 a lot of it is because we have got that heritage we've got everything that has been learned over decades of producing programs for children Thank you so much to Chris Jarvis for joining us this week. It does mean that your AMs and your FMs, those are your airwave memory clips and your first-hand memories emailed in, they will all wait uh, until next week. And Chris will actually return on a future episode as well. Now let's wrap up this week by getting us back on track with our timeline as we stampede towards the BBC's birth. Soon after 2ZY appears in Manchester, another new radio station pops up. And this one's down the road from 2LO in London, and it's a direct rival to them. So you've got 2MT in Essex with Reckless Eckersley, 2LO in London with Sober Burrows, 2ZY in Manchester set up by Metropolitan Vickers and now back in London, 2WP, almost nightly in the summer of 1922. They've not quite got the power of 2LO, but they are literally in the next street and they're run by Western Electric. So yet another wireless company is muscling in. This one's got an American counterpart as well. The Western Electric Company of America knows a lot more than these British stations about making great quality microphones because American companies had to crack long distance. Britain didn't. We are small. So the American mics, and indeed those at this new upstart 2WP London, they're really good, great for long distance, highly sensitive, great for singing and great for hitting the high notes where British mics would distort. So Burroughs is jealous and the Postmaster General is concerned. It looks like the American boom is coming to Britain. Over 20 companies at least are now applying for licences in the summer of 22. So on May the 18th, just one week after 2LO launches, and indeed the next day after 2ZY launches, a meeting is convened of 24 firms with an interest in broadcasting. So next time on the British Broadcasting Century, the Big Six. Plus, summer music, garden parties, oh, and the BBC finally gets its name. All to come as we stampede towards the BBC's big launch here on the British Broadcasting Century. There may be a short gap before the next episode. School holidays. Forgive the minor delay while Paul flies off to... A what? The flight's cancelled? Staycation it is. Normal service will resume. After a few ice creams and board games. The British Broadcasting Century is presented and produced by me, Paul Carenza. Original music is by Will Farmer. If archive clips aren't public domain, then well, we're darned if we know who owns them. If it's you and you wish us to cease, then you know what to do. Do get in touch. Oh, and we're nothing to do with the BBC, by the way. We do like to make that clear every week. Do stay informed, educated and entertained. And join us next time here on the British Broadcasting Century. Time for bed, said Zebedee.